guys, welcome back for episode number 107 of the weekly playback. So there will not be a new video next week because um, I will be at UKGE and London. So I will not be able to shoot a video until after I get back from UKGE. But I'll talk more about that at the end. I only have two games to talk about in this video and one of them is coming to Kickstarter in June. Super excited about that. And thank you to the one person who gave me feedback on the lighting. So if anyone else has feedback to give, uh, please let me know. But hopefully I have fixed the lighting issue. Um, but yeah, so let's just get into the games I played and we'll do all the updates at the end. Let's talk about Ada's Dream. This is a 2024 game for one to four players designed by Tony Lopez and the art is done by Javier Gonzalez Cava and it's published by Alley Cat Games. I was sponsored to do an overview video of this game, but this video, the weekly playback and any other photos uh, or thoughts that I've put out on this game are not sponsored. With that being said, I played a four player game of this and I absolutely loved it. So in this game, it's really easy to break down if you just think of it this way. You can take one of two actions on your turn. You can take either a workshop action or a dice action. If you are doing a workshop action, that means you are going to take a die on a workshop space on the workshop board and move that die into the next space and push out a die of an equal or lower value. You will then gain the reward that is shown on that space. So for example, if I push out a die and the where the space where I pushed out the die shows that I can uh, grab a, a a copper, then I will take a copper. If you empty out a workshop space, you will also get to take a reward of the space you just emptied out, and then you would draw three new dice from the bag, roll them, and add them to the empty space. Then you will add the die you just took to your mill. So you can only do a workshop ac workshop action workshop action if you have a space available here to place the die. If you have three dice, you cannot do a workshop action. You will have to do a dice action. So after you place the die into your mill, you can then play a partner card. Now, a lot of these partner cards require specific value dice. So you need to have the die matching uh, the die value matching the value on the card. So if you took a one or a two, you would be able to play this partner card because this one requires a one or a two. However, some of these do allow you to take any value uh, die and play this card. So for example, this one can be any value, but you will pay the cost and money equal to the die value and then gain the reward shown. So after you play a partner card, just one, you and gain the rewards, then you can activate any assignment cards. And I'll talk about how you get assignment cards in a bit, but assignment cards will be placed underneath your workshop in the matching die space. So if I just took a green die, for example, and I have two assignment cards here, then I would get to activate this twice, which means I would get to go up on the green research track twice. And I'll explain what the research tracks are in a bit. So that is the workshop workshop action. Now let's talk about the dice action. If you are taking a dice action, you are going to move a die from your mill into a die space on your board. And then you will take the corresponding main action on the main board. So this main board has four different areas. The four different areas are Ada's study, travel, institutions, and meeting rooms. So I'll throw out pictures. But if you are doing an institution action, that means you just placed a green die into your board because the institution area is green. So you will choose an institution and then you will uh, select an empty space to or less blah, 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 blah. Select, an, select an empty space equal to or less than your total innovation. So you have to look at your own innovation track, which everyone has on their personal board, uh, which is here. And then you will decrease innovation equal to the level cost plus any levels below that do, that do not contain a, or are below a player disc of your color. So if you are choosing a higher up level and you don't have any of your own discs below that, you're going to have to pay the cost of all the lower levels as well. Then you'll place the disc into the selected space and gain its reward. So that is institutions. If you are traveling, you are going to pay the cost that you need in order to move your player marker to another city. And then you will gain the reward shown and place your uh, disc on the university that you just reached. Um, and in the travel section, you're trying to reach a university in all of the three different regions because then you will meet an objective and gain some extra points for that if you uh, are one of the first two people to do that. Um, if you are doing an Ada study action, you will get one program tile to add to your board. Program tiles are personal objectives that you are trying to meet within your own machine. So for example, I, I got a lot of points from program tiles. 
So here's one. Uh, well, that one doesn't actually work right now, but let's, let's show you this one. Okay, so this one, for example, if you have all dice of the same value underneath this program tile or next to it, depending on where you place it on your board. So for example, if you place it here, and these will slot into your board like that. So if you place it here, then if all the dice correspond to this, like complete that objective, you would get that number of points. You can only get points for program tiles if you have three dice within that line. So they are not considered complete unless you have three dice. So you would slot this somewhere on your board and you would gain the reward shown where you've slotted it and then that's an objective that you're trying to meet throughout the rest of the game. So after taking a program tile, then you can either get a book, an assignment card, or an addition gear. So assignment cards I briefly mentioned before, but they are these smaller cards and they will give you a reward, which you will gain immediately. So for example, if I took this assignment card, I would immediately go up two spaces on the blue research track and then turn this upside down and place it underneath the die, uh, color that I had just placed on my board, which allowed me to take this. So that is how assignment cards work. Um, and finally, if you're doing a meeting room action, you will pay the cost shown uh, of the meeting room that you want to place a disc in, place your disc into that room, and then take a partner card from below that room or to the right of that room. So like a lower level card, cost card, or the card that's directly underneath your room. And then you'll be able to draw a certain number of partner cards into your hand. Um, so that is the meeting room action. I do realize now that when I played the scheme, I would not draw the number of cards into my hand after doing uh, a meeting room action. And I did that action twice. Um, oops, but oh well. <laughs> I still came in second place, but maybe I could have done better if I had actually drawn the cards after doing that. Um, in addition to taking the action, if you advanced on the research track in the corresponding area, you might be able to take an advanced action if you reach a certain breakthrough spot on those research tracks. And this is the only thing that I did not mention in my overview video. And so each different area has a specific uh, advanced action you can do if you reached that breakthrough spot on the research track in that corresponding area. So that is the dice action. Now, despite whether you took a workshop action or a dice action, you can take one bonus action. A bonus action can be to either publish a book or to construct a gear. So if you manage to collect some books, whether by going to aid a study or in some other way by gaining some bonus somewhere else, you can now take that book and turn it in in order to publish it. If you are publishing when doing a workshop action, then you will be moving your steam marker up on your steam track on your personal board, which is really important because this determines how many points you will be able to score for each line in your machine. So for example, in one of my machines, I had three uh, dice with the values six on them. And so if I had put like, for example, a multiplier here and then another multiplier gear here, it would have been six times six times six, which is a whole lot of points. But the maximum number of points you can receive from a single line is 40. So that is something to keep in mind. The gears are multipliers, addition and minus and PEMDAS does not apply. You're just going to go in order. So for example, if I have, uh, a die here and an addition and then a die here and a multiplier you're just going to go in order so you will add this together and then multiply your total once you get it to you know depending on your gears so you will just go in the direction of the line when you either add subtract or multiply whatever the values are so you know the different gears will cost money to place which i'll talk about in a second so um we are talking about publish. So you definitely want to go up on the steam track in order to gain more points for your lines when you go to scoring. So that is the publish action if you do it when you've taken a workshop action. If you do the publish bonus action when you've done one of the other actions, like the meeting room, travel, institutions, or aid of study, you will gain something else. So for example, if I publish a book after having done a meeting room action, I will get to add one purple uh, gear to my supply. There's always two visible and you will get to decide which one you want. So the purple ones all require different costs in order to add them to your board, which I'll discuss in a minute. Whereas the blue and the yellow do not. So the blue and the yellow are all the same. So a yellow one is an addition gear. So it will be placed like this, like this on your board. And it requires you to spend uh, 
two copper and one coal in order to place it. A minus gear will be placed on your board like this, and that requires you to spend one coal and one copper to place it on your board when you do the construct action. And all the multiplier ones, which will be placed on your board like this to show that there are multipliers, cost a different amount. And these are more expensive. So for example, this one will cost you four copper and two coal in order to place. Um, so if I do a publish action, when I've done a meeting room action, I can then take purple gear and add it to my supply. Now that is one bonus action, is to publish a book. The other bonus action you can do is to construct a gear. And again, you can do a bonus action, whether you do a workshop action or a dice action. So when I am constructing a gear, I pay the cost and then I slot it in somewhere on my board into an empty area. Now, all of these are going to be filled with your player discs. So first you will need to move your, remove your player discs and place them in various areas on the board so that those spaces are now available for gears. So you definitely want to be taking actions in travel, institutions, and meetings meeting rooms in order to remove those discs because those are the three areas of the board in which you can place discs. When I played, I did not even go near the institutions. I only placed discs in the meeting rooms and in the travel area. So those are the bonus actions you can take to either publish or construct a gear. Um, so we talked about all of the actions you can take. So you're going to continue in this fashion until someone has placed nine dice on their board. Then you will finish the round, you know, depending on who was first player or whatever. And then uh, you will go to scoring. So you're going to score for each individual area of the board. Now, each individual area of the board has an objective to meet. So for example, if you were the first person to reach a major university in all three regions, you would have placed a disc onto one of the objective spaces, which would give you points. And then you're also going to be scoring points uh, based on each area and how they score points. Uh, so for uh, travel, there was like uh, different universities were worth a different number of points. And if someone else's disc was on top of you, you would also get an additional point uh, if someone else's disc had been placed on top of yours. Um, so it would be worth it to go to a university that you think other people are going to want to go to later on. So different areas will score in different ways. So for example, the meeting rooms were an area control game. So whoever had the most discs in a meeting room would take the top tile there, and then you would get two points per certain color card you have, per partner card. So there are partner cards, which you would be playing throughout the game, and you start with starter cards in your hand, and there are advanced partner cards that you would be trying to collect throughout the game by going to the meeting rooms. So let me just show you some of the advanced cards, for example. And the advanced cards will be worth points. So here is an advanced card, for example, which is a really good one. And it's going to be worth three points at the end of the game. It's a green color. You would play it when you either have a two or three dice from the workshop that you just took and you would be able to do all of this. So you would get to go up two on your innovation and you would be able to do that, whatever that means, a book and a program. I don't know what that equal sign I guess you can turn in a book for a program tile and yeah, I think that's what that means. So you would get to do all of that. So, you know, you're trying to collect advanced partner cards throughout the game by going to the meeting rooms. So if you had the most discs in a certain meeting room, you would now get a special tile which will allow you to get a certain number of points based on a certain color partner card. So if you have a lot of pink partner cards, for example, you would want to try to place your discs into the room that will give you a multiplier for pink cards. So that is, you know, the extra points you will get from the meeting room. So again, each area will score a bit differently. Then you will be scoring, so you, again, you'll get points from your partner cards, you'll be scoring your program tiles. Now you can only score a program tile if you have three dice in that uh, uh, row or column. So if you don't have three dice, you will not be able to score your program tiles and get the points indicated up here. And again, you would have gotten these from Ada's study. Then finally, you will be scoring your machine. Now you will only score a machine if there are three dice and two gears in the line. So you have lines that go horizontally as well as vertically. And again, how many points you can earn is 
determined by your steam marker. So if you're up to here, for example, you would be able to earn 25 points maximum per line. So that is when you strategically decide where to place your dice, depending on their numbers, their values, and whether you're going to be using multipliers, addition, or subtraction gears uh, when you place those gears. So for example, me, uh, you can see my board here, I placed lower value dice all in the last dice in the last column, uh, and I had a program tile that gave me points for that as well because it said all dice in this uh, uh, in this line are less than four, which they were. And then I used subtraction gear. So since they were lower value dice, subtracting that amount would not be a huge like deal. Like it would just be subtracting a little bit. So that was really good for me. Um, I had some higher value dice up here, like all of this work column was filled with all six value dice, but I think I reached only 20 on my Steam Tracker if I'm re recalling correctly. So at that point, it wouldn't have been worth it to have two multipliers there. Like it wouldn't have been worth it to have a multiplier here and a multiplier here because 36 times six, like I would not be, you know, the maximum you can get is 40 points per line. So that is not going to be worth it, obviously, right? So I believe I had a multiplier and then an addition. So I believe it was... 36 plus something if I recall correctly um, but again my maximum that I could get for each line that was completed was 20 I believe um, and then you will subtract two points for each space that does not have a gear so you definitely want to get gears out onto your board because every space that doesn't have a gear and if your disc is still there that still counts you will get minus two points and then after you add up all your points uh whoever has the most points will win so yeah super awesome game i really loved it it felt like a lot of mini games within one big game so for example in the meeting room you have area majority uh in the travel section you're just trying to race up to the top and get to the different universities in the different regions so that you can get that uh, point uh, the objective at the very top uh, institutions I didn't do institutions but like it just looks like uh, you know just a track that you're trying to advance up and then Ada study is really good for getting stuff so Ada study is where you get program tiles where you get books and you know uh, assignment cards um, so yeah so each area was a little bit different which I really really loved and you know it was just it just really worked really well together. Um, it's really long at four players. Of course, it was our first time playing. We do intend to play again because we really loved it. Um, so we're definitely going to play this again. So I hope I'll get to keep this prototype and play it again. Um, but yeah, so we really, really loved it. And um, but it was quite long at four players. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. Um, but once everyone knows the rules, I think it will go by really quickly. Like, again, the only things you really need to remember are that you're going to do one of two actions. You're going to do a workshop action and a dice action or a dice action. And then depending on which of those actions you do, that will determine the other things you get to do. Really, like once you learn the rules, it's pretty easy to go, you know, and play play the game. Um, I'm trying to see if I have any negatives to talk about. I do not know if I have any negatives. Uh, let me think. Um, ba -dum -ba -ba -bum. You know what? I cannot think of a negative at the moment. <laughs> I'm sure when I was playing it, I was like, oh, maybe this could be better. I know that there was something I had brought up when I was playing the game, but now it does not come to mind. So now I cannot remember. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that you'll have to be mindful of. Like for example, I realize now that I don't think I paid the coal when I advanced my steam marker. But at the same time, I don't think I, you know, added more cards to my hand when I uh, did the meeting action. So, you know, there's a, a number of icons you'll have to be mindful of so that you don't miss things that you should be doing. Um, but yeah, it was a really, really good game and I really, really loved it. I think the only negative I have that at four players, it can be quite long. So I would not recommend it at four players. I think you would want to play maximum three. Nick, yeah, I think maximum three would be good for this game. Um, so yeah, I think that's really it. I really loved it. If I had to compare it to a game, uh, it's comparable to Sankore. So Sankore, which is published by Osprey Games, also felt like mini games within a game. So that one I feel like is heavier than this game, but Sankore also had a travel section where you're moving your camel along. It also had like an area control section. It also had a section where you're building uh, certain things. And yeah, so very similar in that respect, but I would say Sankore is heavier and has a lot more setup time. So if you're looking for a game that is heavier, 
but does not have as much setup time as a game like Sankore would highly recommend this game. But both games are really, really great. Um, yeah, I cannot think of a negative at the moment. I probably should have taken notes while I was playing so that I could have something to critique, but <laughs> I'm sure, so my friends, one of my friends who I play games with, he watches my videos. So maybe he can leave a comment below uh, giving his critiques of this game because right now I just cannot remember anything. <laughs> so, but yeah, I'm really, for, you know, glad that I had the opportunity to play this game and create content for it just because I really 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 loved it. Um, so yeah, so and I'm sure that the production copy is going to be much nicer with amazing components. It is Alley Cat game so I expect it, I you know think it will be. And this dual layered board is really cool for all of the dice and the gears to slot into. Very nice. And it's really cool how you can just slot in the program tiles like that. So it kind of actually like looks like a machine. Like it's really really cool when you play it. So yeah. So that is Ada's Dream. So again, it's coming to Kickstarter on June 3rd. So yeah, so let's move on. Let's talk about Kazuka. Kazuka is a 2022 game for two to six players designed by Leo Colovini. And the art is done by Bartolomeusz Kordowski and it's published by Pegasus Spiel Games. Now this is a betting game. So it's a betting and a cooperative and a deduction game. It's very, uh, it's fun, it's interesting. Um, so you know, you, it's about communication and how you know you as a team can hopefully make these animals escape the zoo. So I really love the theme of this game because as you guys know, I'm an animal lover and uh, you know, I don't want to see animals in a zoo unless it's truly a very good zoo with like and truly cares about conservation But I feel like there's very few of those in this world I think zoos claim to care about conservation and stuff, but then they are really just about money making But anyway, um, so I will mention that this is a review copy I received at I believe UKGE last year and I just finally got it played before I head to UKGE again um, So you are going to have this board and there are two different boards uh, so, you know, depending on how easy or difficult you want it, you can play with that corresponding side. Each person is going to choose an animal and take the corresponding tokens. So there's a bunch of different animals you can choose from. So for example, uh, let me just pull out the animal card so I can tell you what your options are. So the animal options are... Doo -doo 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 -doo. So we've got a rhino. And each animal will have its own special ability. We have a parrot, we have a monkey, we have a lion, we have an elephant, uh, we have a sloth, we have a seal, and we have a snake, we have a chameleon, and an eagle. And I believe that's it, yes. So there's different animal cards and they each come with a special ability. The game does recommend, suggest certain animals to play on your, in your first game, which is what we did. Um, so I believe in our first game, one person was a snake, one person was a chameleon, and one person was an eagle. So I played a three player game of this. Uh, it probably would be a little bit more interesting and fun at a higher player count. So each person is going to be dealt a certain number of cards. So, and each person will have a little player aid which shows you how many cards of each color there are in the game because that's important to know. So the different cards have different kinds of things on them. So for example, like a rope or whatever. So these are the tools that animals are using to try to escape from the zoo. And then there are these wild tool cards which you will be trying to earn. So each person is going to have a certain number of cards and you're just going to keep those cards secret. So you're not going to show other people what your cards are, obviously. So starting with the first player, the first player in the first section of the board is going to place an animal token. So for example, uh, they might place an animal token on the green too. So that's like telling the other players like, hey, I have two green cards in my hand. Now the next player in line has to place a token in the next, in the same section or the next section of the board. You cannot skip a section. So they would not be able to skip this section entirely in order to go to this section. So again, they can place a token ahead of the token that was just placed, their animal token, but they cannot skip an entire section. So either the next section or the same section. So as 
as you're placing tokens, you're kind of indicating to other people like, hey, you just put down a green two, so I'm gonna put down a, you know, my token on a green three, which maybe means I have a green card as well. So you can't skip sections. So now the next player might want to put down a token on a green four. So that's showing them that between the three of them, they have four green cards, hopefully. Um, so you're going to continue in this fashion, just placing down your tokens and trying to communicate to others without actually come speaking, which cards you have in your hand. And you're trying to get a, you know as far along as possible. You're going to reach a certain point where you might not be able to place a token. And so at that point, you're going to say, okay, we're going to uh, uh, attempt an escape. So at that point, you will say stop, we're stopping, and then you will, everyone will reveal their hands. And you're going to look at the farthest token that you placed. And you will see that on a lot of these uh, uh, spaces farther along, you see a black star. So if you have the exact number of matching cards, uh, first, if you have the number of cards or exceed the number of cards that you stopped on. So for example, let's suppose someone placed a token on a seven, their animal token on a seven green, and then the next player said stop and everyone revealed their cards. Let's suppose we had a total of eight green cards. In that case, you will get the number of stars indicated, which is 13, but you would not get the bonus. The bonus you only get if you have exactly that number of cards. And the bonus is one of these will now be shuffled into the pile that, of cards that is dealt out to everyone. So you once you collect stars for every 10 stars you have, when you start the next round, you will lay out a certain number of cards face up, which basically belongs to everyone. So for example, in a certain round, these three cards might be face up for everyone, which means we already know we have one blue, we have one green and one purple. So now you have to take that into consideration, which can be a little bit tricky because for example, if someone goes to say a four blue, is that including this card or is it not including this card? So it can make things a little bit tricky, but it definitely helps to have these extra colored cards because you're going to get farther and farther along. So your goal is in order to escape the scheme, you have to reach the last section and when you reveal, have that number of cards by the seventh round. So you are trying to get all the way here by the seventh round. And again, this is the more difficult side of the, no, this is the more difficult side of the board. So yeah, so it's going to be, you know, harder and harder as you play because the numbers are gonna get higher and higher and you have to communicate without actually speaking. So yeah, it's kind of like a betting game and a deduction game in which you're trying to figure out who has which cards. And your special abilities you can use once per round can be really useful. So. You you know, your special ability might allow you to ask someone, hey, do you have X number of cards, uh, X number of green cards? And they can say yes. So based on where they placed a token and based on where someone else played a token, it may allow you to, de to deduce how many green cards that player actually has. Um, so yeah, so it's a really fun game. You're going to be increasing your levels as you play. So um, for example, you start out with level one. So that means each person starts out dealt with 20 cards and zero cards visible. In the next level, once you've attained a certain number of stars, again, by, you know, uh, having that number of cards between all of you and stopping at, a, at an appropriate time, then you would reach level two. So each person would now get dealt 21 cards um, and Oh, sorry, not each person, not each person. Between all of the players, you would be dealt 21 cards and you would have one card visible. So you're trying to get those stars so that you can increase in your levels and 10 is the highest you can go. So between all of you, you would have 28 cards uh, between all of you and six cards visible. Um, and again, these tools you earn if you had the exact number of cards where you en ended. And these would be shuffled into the draw pile. And these are wilds, so they count as each single card type, which is pretty cool. So yeah, it's a fun little deduction um, uh, betting game because you're kind of betting you're you know you need to know when to stop so yeah it's a fun little uh deduction and betting game so if that sounds like something you're interested in i would definitely check out kazooka so yeah i think i would like to play this again but at a higher player account with the mo more difficult side of the board i think in our three player game when we won i think we won in round five if i remember correctly so yeah so we definitely like to make things a little bit more difficult so that is kazooka so let's move on 
So let's go into games that I have received or am backing. I did receive a game, but it's currently at my business uh, post box and I haven't had a chance to pick it up. So hopefully I will get to show that to you guys after UKGE. Um, and I know that I have Sans, I think it's called Sans from Devere Games on its way to me, but it's due to arrive after I'm shooting this video. So unfortunately I don't have it to show to you guys, but you know I'm a big fan of Devere Games, so I'm really excited to receive that. Um, so currently I'm still just backing Canvas Big Box for the Big Box, which I discussed in detail in my last video. And then, uh, yeah, I'm just still backing Epistocracy, Episto, Episto, Epistocracy, Epistocracy, I think is a proper way to pronounce it, at its pledge manager level, uh, just to see if I can get a review copy of it later, because um, I would really love that game, but really tight on money, like super tight on money for a lot of personal reasons related to taxes and a bunch of other stuff and things just breaking in my house and things like that. So I really should be more careful about spending money. Um, so yeah, so that's it right now. Um, so yeah, so let's move on to updates. Um, so the first update I'll talk about is the Obsession uh, giveaway winner. So he received um, his name is Kadian and he received his game. Uh, he'll still be receiving all the new stuff once that's available, but he sent some pictures. So I'll just post some pictures. So he sent some pictures of him and uh, his cat and his cat with the game. So he's really, really excited. So that makes me really happy that um, the winner of this game did not already have it and he's super excited to play it. So just wanted to share uh, the giveaway pictures with his permission, of course. Um, cat colony, lots of bad news. Well, good news and bad news. Uh, I guess I'll start with the bad news first. The bad news is that I had built a third big shelter, which I put in colony number one. Colony number one is kind of a swampy colony. It's like two hills that kind of meet in a little valley. We'll call it a valley, but I mean, obviously it's like little. Um, and it's very swampy down there. It's like super muddy, really wet, really gross. And that's where we've placed some wooden pallets and I have already placed two big shelters and one small shelter on wooden pallets there. Um, this side of the hill flattens out a little bit and there's a narrow strip of land, which is where I place the food for the cats when I feed them. And on the other side is a brick wall where there are some dumpsters. And this isn't a parking lot of a plaza in which I'll get into in a minute why I need to mention that. So I, with the help of someone else, placed two new wooden pallets to cover this like swampy area, like super swampy, had to have on my rain boots. The water came up all the way to the top of my boots. It was really gross, really wet and muddy and disgusting. Placed two new wooden pallets there and then placed another big shelter. Management called and complained saying that they're not happy with the third shelter because it peeks out a little bit beyond the brick wall of the dumpster, which is just complete garbage because uh, dumpster garbage <laughs> but it's complete garbage because no one even parks in this parking lot this parking lot that belongs to a plaza is the back parking lot and literally no customers ever park in this parking lot because there are no store entrances from anywhere in this parking lot so they're just being super nitpicky about the the third shelter showing a little bit beyond the dumpster wall because they want everything super concealed so i'm like they're just being assholes like these are stray cats that need a place to sleep at night you know there's like 20 of them you know the few shelters i had already there probably not even enough for all of them so i bring in another big one and they're complaining about it so they want me to move it they want me to move it to somewhere that is a little bit more concealed but it's very difficult to do because again it's a little valley there's not much space um, once you go up the hill on the other side it flattens out at the top and there's a railroad track there which is used and it's used by cargo trains and so it's you know not the safest area and beyond the railroad tracks it's just flat land and not discreet so not a good place for the shelter so really this was the only place that I could think of to put this new shelter on top of these pallets in this swampy area. So very upset about that. So I'm really upset about management complaining when there's really no reason to complain because customers do not park in this parking lot. Like they're just being really nitpicky and just have no compassion for these poor cats. So that makes me really angry. So that's the first update with respect to the stray cats. The second update is that in colony number three, which is the one where we're trying to relocate all of the cats, all but one cat has been trapped. One cat is just really hard to catch and we call him ghost cat me and the rescue organization and ghost cat is really difficult to trap but all of his friends were trapped 
they were spayed and neutered, given their vaccinations, and sent to a barn to live. So they're living a happy barn cat life now. They're being acclimated to the barn. So uh, really happy about that. So yeah, so we just need to catch the last cat. We're determined to get the last cat so that he can join his friends. So that is the cat update. So please keep your fingers crossed for the last cat, hoping that we can trap him and reunite him with his friends. Uh, so let's see what the next update is. Uh, UKGE. So yeah, so I'm leaving for London on Friday, um, which is May 24th, arriving there on May 25th, uh, just enjoying London for a few days. And then I will be attending UKGE on Friday, May 31st and Saturday, June 1st. Um, the only plans I have for UKGE at the moment, I'm just going to turn down this light a minute. A little bit just because I feel like it might be too bright and you guys might be like what is with the sliding okay so um the only plans I have at UKGE at the moment are to play a game of inventors of the south tigress with Luke from the broken meeple and one other friend um you know I told them that I would limit it to the three of us because otherwise it will be quite long I'm taking it with me to UK so that we can play um, but, you know, I have another friend who would like to play a game with me at some point. So I'll see if he has a smaller game that we can play or I'll ask him to just join us and play Inventors of the Salt Tigers if he's into heavy games because it is quite a heavy game. So that's the only plan I have right now for UKGE. Otherwise, it's going to be a pretty pill, uh, pill a pretty chill UKGE for me. So, you know, I don't have any... Uh, publisher meetings lined up, nothing like that. I'll just go talk to publishers on my own time and just kind of wander around. Um, you know, I know I say this before every single convention that I don't want to come back with a lot of games, but I mean it. I really don't want to come back with a lot of games. Uh, so, you know, because I have so many that are waiting to be played. So we'll see what happens. Honestly, there's like nothing even that really catches my eye that like, you know, I need to go through the list again. I think that I maybe bookmarked one game that I think I want to get my hands on. Um, but I can't remember now what that game that is. So if you're watching this before UKGE and you know of any games that are actually going to be released at UKGE that you think I should get my hands on, that you would like me to talk about in a future video, uh, leave the name of that game in the comments below and I'll do my best to get it then. So yeah, so that is the UKGE update. Um, I'm also going to be doing the crystal maze when I'm in London. This is something I've been wanting to do for years and begging and begging friends to do it with me and no one would ever agree to do it with me. So I'm really excited that I'm finally going to be able to do the crystal maze experience in London. We will see how it is. It's like a combination of an obstacle course and puzzles like mental challenges and stuff. Super excited for that. So that's kind of game related. So I thought I would mention it. Um, I hope my friend and I don't get split up because according to the website, if you don't book like the maximum number of people per group, you, there's a chance you could get split up into separate groups. But I hope that won't happen because that would really suck. Then I'd just have to play with a bunch of strangers and that'd be kind of a bit weird. Um, so yeah, so that is the London update. Um, okay, another update. So this is a shameless plug. If you would like to buy some Board Games in a Minute merch, I will leave the link below. And if you want to buy some, it would be great if you can purchase some merch before September because um, Sir Meeple, the owner of this uh, website, has said that if you are a creator who hasn't sold an item within the last year and he's going to start looking at that in September, then he will remove all of the merch from the website, which would make me really sad to see all of my merch removed from this website. So if you've been wanting a Board Games in a Minute shirt or sticker or anything else, please go buy something from the website. Now is would be a really great time um, so that my merchandise does not get removed because that would make me really sad. Um, the designs are super cool. Like I really like the one uh, that just says board games in a minute and then just has like a crescent moon and stuff like that. I really like the elephant one. I like the one where it's me like on top of an elephant. Um, though, you know, again, do not ride elephants. Um, so you know, it's not meant to depict me riding an elephant, but just kind of like standing on top of an elephant. But yeah. Um, so yeah, just, you know, if you're interested in any board games in a minute merch, check out the website. The link is below. Um, and, you know, it would be great if you could purchase something before September because then my merch will not disappear. Um, so yeah, so I hope it doesn't disappear. I'm going to ask him if I can just buy my own merch and keep it there because <laughs> I, you know, I have gained a little bit of weight. So I think I might need a bigger sized shirt. Um, who knows? We'll see. <laughs> TMI. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. 
So let's talk about Palestine. I feel like I have a lot to say, and a lot of this is going to be me uh, reiterating stuff that was said in videos past. Uh, and I'm going to be going back to 2021 because something came up recently and I feel like people in this industry are just beyond ridiculous and hypocritical. Um, so the genocide is going on and, you know, for the most part, people in this industry have been dead silent. Rafa is under bombardment all the time. You know, uh, we've already discussed how they have nowhere else to go. Like they've been pushed out of the north into the middle of Gaza and then all the way to the south. And every time they were forced to leave, Israel would say, oh, it's going to be safe where you're going. We're not going to bomb there. No, it was complete bullshit. We already knew this from the beginning. We already knew from the beginning that genocide and ethnic cleansing was the intent of Israel. And they were trying to get them out, out of all of Israel, out of all of Gaza, in order to just kill them all um, and remove them all. So now they are in the very south of, La of Gaza, where it is incredibly crowded, over a million people in a small area like the size of Heathrow Airport, which is insane. It's absolutely insanity. Um, and they are being bombarded and killed and the genocide is ongoing and they literally have nowhere to go. Israel told them that they would be safe in the south of Gaza, which was a lie. All Israel does is lie, lie, lie. Like literally all they've been doing is lying since the beginning of this genocide. Lying about how many people were killed on October 7th, lying about babies being beheaded, which was never true. Lying about babies being put in ovens, which was not true. Just lie after lie after lie. Israel does nothing but lie and it lies to the Palestinians and now they are in Rafah being bombarded and the genocide continues. And I talked about how Rodney Smith gave a bullshit statement uh, back in November about why he would not condemn the genocide. You know, basically like, oh, it's complicated, blah, 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 but my heart goes out to you who, you know, people who are speaking about it and losing followers, like just complete bullshit. He has made statements about other issues. And between November and now, how many months has it been? How many months has it been where he, Eric Lang, Suzanne Sheldon, and all these other people who are so vocal about other issues could have educated themselves if they wanted to? If they wanted to, they could educate themselves about what is happening and speak about it, but they choose not to. This is a choice that these people are making. They are making the choice to stay silent. They are making a choice to not condemn a genocide when they have spoken up about Black Lives Matter, when they've spoken up, up about trans rights, when they've spoken up about women's reproductive rights, when they've sp spoken up about Ukraine. They have spoken up about other issues, but they are choosing to remain silent about this. And there's no excuse that Rodney and Eric Lang are Canadian. They talk about American political issues all the time. Eric Lang has been talking a lot about the Democratic and Republican parties and the elections coming up in the U.S. So nope, they've talked about political issues that relate to the U.S. and other places before. They've talked about Ukraine, so there is no excuse for their silence on this genocide. They just choose to stay silent because they're fucking sellouts. They're Zionist shills. They don't want to upset their Zionist publisher friends and designers. That's basically it. Like if you are choosing to stay silent when you have been outspoken about other issues and you have a large platform, you are showing the world what you are. So with that being said, you know, again, I'm going to go back to 2021. What happened in 2021 was I was scheduled to review a copy, create content of this new game that was coming out on Kickstarter from Burnt Island Games. Burnt Island Games and Kids Table Board Gaming are sister companies. They're both owned by Helena and Josh Kappel, uh, who are Zionists and they live in Canada. So when Helena, uh, during this time, there was a uh, you know, um, uh, Israeli, the, I, Israel was killing Palestinians during this time. Um, so there was a lot of uh, tension there. There was a lot of killing going on. Palestinian babies were being bombed as always. Palestinians were being killed. And I was outspoken about Palestine. Eric Lang made a shitty statement on Twitter and Facebook about what was happening in Palestine at that time. I called him out on it. Well, how did he respond to me with whataboutisms? When I responded to his tweets very respectfully, and I will link the old videos below in which I discussed all of this and provide all the screenshots of his Facebook, of his tweets and of my tweets and how I responded to him, I respectfully called him out on his shitty take. And then he, responded with what about isms oh sarah do you care about the have you said anything about the uyghurs have you said anything about the rohingya in fact i had in fact i had posted about the uyghurs and the rohingya and 
other Muslims who are killed in India, because India has a lot of issues with uh, Hindu supremacy in India right now, with a lot of Muslims being killed, uh, which you never really see about on the news. But I have spoken about, 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 about these issues before, but Eric Lang responded with a whataboutism to me, which if someone did that to him with Black Lives Matter, how do you think he would react to that? So that was the first like bullshit thing he did. Then he basically retracted his bullshit statement that he had made about Palestine and said, yes, Palestinian lives matter, but he didn't elaborate much more. He didn't really go into it much more. He didn't bother to educate himself on Zionism and the evil that Zionism is, whatever. So he left it at that, right? So um, Helena Keppel had originally liked his bullshit take that he had on Israel and Palestine. And this is, again, all back in 2021. So she, I reached out to her to inquire like why the game hasn't been sent to me when I was supposed to be, you know, creating content for this game. She responded saying, can we have a phone call about it or a video chat about it rather? So I said yes, but it, the way she said that it sat very badly with me and I knew that something was up. Uh, given everything and given, you know, I knew that she was Jewish at this point, didn't know she was a Zionist, but I knew that she was Jewish and that she had liked Eric Lang's shitty take on Facebook because that was visible for me to see. So what did I do? I recorded the entire conversation. What happened during this conversation? What happened during this conversation is Helena Kappel could not tell me what the difference is between Palestinian Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter. She said that the reason she would no longer send me this game to review is because I said Palestinian Lives Matter and she didn't like how I strong-armed Eric Lang into making a statement. Who the hell can strong arm someone like Eric Lang? He has got to be one of the most pompous, arrogant, like, you know, people in the industry who does whatever the fuck he wants. No one can strong arm him into doing anything. Eric Lang is Eric Lang. Like, he is one of the most arrogant, big headed people in the industry, and no one can force him to do anything if he doesn't want to do it. But she, in this conversation, which I released the recording, said that I strong armed Eric Lang into changing his statement on Israel and Palestine. She said that I yelled at him, which again, not true. You can see screenshots in previous videos that I've posted of everything I said during. Uh, in his and on his Facebook or an, on Twitter, not, I did not yell one single time. So, and then I asked her, you know, she says she doesn't like people, she doesn't want to send her games to people who are political. She doesn't want to send her games to someone who said Palestinian lives matter. And I said at this point, okay, well, you sponsor a black family and they're all about Black Lives Matter. Our family plays games. You sponsor them. At this point, she tried to jump down my throat and say, oh, you don't want me to sponsor them? Like, no, fucking listen. I'm saying that you're sponsoring a black family because they are, you know, you want to support minorities in the industry and they're all about Black Lives Matter. You had Black Lives Matter on your website. Like if you went to Burnt Island Games and Kid Tables, Kids Table Board Gaming at that time, I don't know if it still is on their website, but in 2021, they had a whole Black Lives Matter uh, banner or statement, whatever, on their website. So, but now here she is telling me that she doesn't want to send her game to someone who's political. Really what she's saying is she doesn't want to send her game to someone who cares about Palestinian lives. So I asked her, tell me what the difference is between Palestinian Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter. She could not answer this question. I asked her multiple times to answer this question and she could not do it. She could not tell me what the difference is. There is no fucking difference. They are very very similar. Like the way blacks are treated in America and the way Palestinians are treated in Palestine, very similar. There is no difference. It's a group of oppressed people, of people who don't have the same rights as other people necessarily, you know, trying to speak up for themselves and trying to say our lives matter too. But she didn't want to send me the game because I said Palestinian lives matter. At one point she even said to me, oh, I love how much, how you care about animals, but you know, humans, forget humans, just stick to animals. Like the recording is there for people to listen to. What happened after I released this recording? Well, first I did an interview with someone and talked to him about what happened and talked to him about the conversation. People didn't want to believe me when I did this interview and didn't want to believe what Helena said. So I said, fine, I have a recording. I will release the recording. The recording corroborates every single thing I said in that interview about what Helena said and what happened in that conversation. So then what happened? Now you have this Zionist who's loved by people like Eric Ling and Rodney Smith and other people in the industry, people who claim to be about 
about human rights, now they've got this dilemma. Like, here is this person that they love in this industry who clearly doesn't want to give a game to someone to review because she's for Palestinian Lives Matter. So they turned it all into me about being dangerous. So apparently, Helena Kappel got a death threat based on the conversation I received. No proof was ever given of this death threat she received. The only like public thing that there was was some random person made some video about Helena Kappel, some executioners, whatever, like, I don't even know if it should be taken seriously, but whatever, did not seem like a serious death threat to me, but the uh, supposedly she'd received death threats by email or phone calls, whatever. None of those were re revealed. None of those were shown to the public to sh show that she actually received any death threat. But apparently she received a death threat and as a result, I was labeled dangerous. I was told I'm dangerous because I released a recording which resulted in Helena Kappel getting a death threat. Completely insane, completely illogical, makes no fucking sense whatsoever. I am not responsible for what some third party does who I have no connection to. So should not be responsible for that. When someone named Zoe complained about how she was treated by tabletop simulator mods because she is trans and she was talking about being trans in a chat room and there was a whole uproar about tabletop simulator and all these people claimed at that time that they're going to boycott tabletop simulator for how this trans woman was treated. Let's suppose a death threat had been made to one of those mods. Do you think that they would label this trans person as dangerous? No, of course not. Or think about Black Lives Matter. Suppose someone black, like let's suppose a member of our family plays games, outed a publisher as being anti-black, as being racist, and then that publisher received a death threat. Do you think that they would call Mitch or Starla or whatever dangerous now because some third party made a death threat and they have nothing to do with that third party? No. It is a trope. It is an Islamophobic trope that Muslims are dangerous and so very easily I'm labeled dangerous now. It's no coincidence that I'm like what, the only female Muslim content creator and now I'm labeled dangerous. I'm being ostracized. I, people are being told to unfriend and unfollow me and stop doing business with me. At this point in time a lot more publishers stopped working with me. Previously publishers had stopped working with me because me and stupid Quackalope went to Universal Studios well after lockdown was over and took off our photos for a picture and I'm the one who got bullied and harassed to no end uh, for that and Quackalope got no shit whatsoever for that and you know I fucking hate Quackalope like that everyone knows because he basically at that point uh, distanced himself from me to save his own ass so everyone knows what Quackalope's uh, character is like at this point I don't even need to tell you guys like you already all know about you know how he tried to extort a publisher so I'm not even gonna go into Quackalope like he's already shown what kind of a person he is to the world so that was the first time that people like tried to blacklist me and stop working with me and then what happened in 2021 with Palestine so you know, a lot of the people, so a lot of people were told, I just, you know, I have proof and I provided proof before, a screenshot of messages that people were getting, being told to stop being friends with me, to unfollow me and block me. And a lot of people did, including someone who works for Skybound Games, who actually came to my home. I invited him inside my home. We played board games together. We went for a hike together. We had dinner together. And even this asshole blocked me and, uh, you know, unfriended me. Um, so people in this industry have no backbone. They have no integrity, despite knowing what I am like a person. A lot of people who even knew me in person blocked me and unfriended me because they were being told by Helena Kappel and others who are friends with Helena Kappel to do so. So Helena Kappel basically outed herself as a Zionist. Like, it's very clear that she and her husband are Zionists. And now let's fast forward. Fast forward and... and Another thing, back then, people were trying to silence me by pretending to care about Palestinian rights. So the same people who were calling me dangerous were just posting Palestinian Lives Matter on their Twitter, like just one statement and thinking that that's sufficient and that's enough. Like, you know, I was getting called all kinds of names. I was being told that like, oh, I just care about Palestinian Lives Matter for clout. Like again, fucking idiots, like just Google me. Like you could have seen from my LinkedIn that I have a master's degree in Middle Eastern studies and I've studied the Palestine-Israel conflict at a graduate level and it's something that I've cared about since my you know high school years when I first learned about it when I became aware about what's happening to Palestinians when I was in high school I have cared about it since then like People who are friends with me on Facebook can go into my profile pictures, go all the way back to like 2005, 2006, and I have 
profile pictures that have to do with Palestinian rights. So if this is just me clout chasing, like have I been clout chasing since 2006? Like what? No. Um, so yeah, so I've cared about this for a very long time. I have a master's degree in Middle Eastern studies because I am of Middle Eastern descent and I care about what is happening in the region. But you had like complete idiots claiming that I'm clout chasing. Oh, she thinks she's an attorney and she knows so much. Like I had people calling me an elitist. Like I went to law school, I worked hard for my degrees and I acquired a lot of student debt while working hard for my degrees. I do not come from a privileged background. I come from a working class background. Both me and my two, three, not both. So me and my two sisters, we've all acquired debt in order to get to where we are. My younger sister just graduated from medical school. My older sister is a doctor. I am a lawyer, but we worked hard to get to where we are. We do not come from a privileged background. I come from a working class background. My dad was a businessman. He died in 2010. He had an engineering background, but he was a businessman and he died in a car accident in 2010. And then things were difficult for my mom. I do not come from a privileged background like complete bullshit um, but you know people wanted to call me an elitist because I'm a lawyer like if you want to be you know if you think I'm an elitist because I worked hard to get where I am then fuck you like you could do the same you know the vast majority of content creators in this industry you know you know they're not like professionals like doctors and lawyers and so maybe they have some insecurity complex I really don't fucking know but the things that people were saying about me at this time just absolutely ridiculous and at this time so people were like just posting one or two lines Palestinian lives matter to show that they care about Palestine to show that oh they can still support their Zionist friend Helena Kappel call me dangerous and still support Palestine complete utter bullshit okay because they have repeatedly called on other people in the industry to stop being friends with and stop following bad actors. Who are bad actors in this industry? Bad actors are people who have used their positions of power in order to have sexual relationships with others. They are people who have, you know, not uh, supported women's reproductive rights when uh, Roe versus Wade was overturned. There are people who don't support Black Lives Matter and have said all lives matter. These are people that they have actively called on others in the industry to unfollow, not do business with, and so on. So these are bad actors in their eyes. So why are Zionists not fucking bad actors? Why are people who support apartheid, who support the killing of Palestinians, who support the genocide of Palestinians, why are they not considered bad actors? I would love someone to explain this to me because they are fucking bad actors. Zionists are the Nazis of today. They are fucking Nazis. They believe in apartheid. They believe that Palestinians do not deserve the same rights. They support the ongoing genocide of Palestinians. Uh, and the numbers reported of the Palestinians killed are far less than the actual amount of Palestinians killed. And that is being done purposefully to try to convince people that it is not a genocide. Like Zionists control the media. Like it is not anti-Semitic to say that. I'm not saying Jews control the media. I'm saying Zionists control the media and you can look up this information. You can see who the major news agencies are controlled by, who they regularly donate money to, who, you know, all of these people are. It is visible for everyone to see. And you can see that Zionists have power and they control the narrative. They are bad actors. Yet here you have board game people supporting bad actors in this industry, Helena Kappel and her companies who are fucking Zionists. You have people promoting their games who claim to care about Palestinian lives matter. It would be no different than me, you know, supporting a game, playing a game that is by someone who, you know, while I claim, oh, I'm for Black Lives Matter and playing a game by a publisher who says all lives matter. It is no fucking different. It's no different than playing a game by someone who is against uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, offices across universities in America. You know, it'd be like saying, yeah, I support Black Lives, but I'm still gonna play this game from this publisher. But that is exactly what is happening. That is exactly what's happening in this industry. You see people to this day promoting games from Kids Table Board Gaming and Burnt Island Games. These people are fucking hypocrites. There is no other way to explain it. They're hypocrites and they're Zionist shills. They want to keep their Zionist 
friends and publishers happy and keep that money coming in. Like our family plays games. Most black people in America are for Palestinian rights, but have uh, Mick and Starla ever said anything about Palestinian Lives Matter? No, they'll occasionally like a tweet on uh, Twitter about it, but they have never said anything themselves. And people are gonna start shitting on me like, oh, look at you, a minority like shitting on other minorities to speak up about this, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, let's be real, we know why they're quiet. It's because they are sponsored by Burnt Island Games and Kids Table Board Gaming. Like you gotta keep that Zionist money coming in, right? Like, so you're going to stay silent. You're not going to say something that is going to upset your sponsor. And saying Palestinian lives matter and being outspoken by Palestinian lives, Helena Kappel doesn't like that, which is very clear from the recording that I had made public. So this industry is just full of hypocrites. It's full of Zionist shills and sellouts, okay? So now, some of the same people who called me dangerous and were shitting on me back in 2021, what are they finally doing now? Uh, finally, months later, they are this person who accused me of trying to get her fired at one point, Jillian. Uh, so she works currently for Brother Wise Games, but back in the time, back in the day, she worked for Capstone Games. And back in the day, she accused me of trying to get her fired because she violated her brother's uh, confidentiality. So she released an email, made it public, sent it to someone else. She sent an email that I sent to her, to Suzanne Sheldon, who then made it public. So she violated Capstone's own confidentiality. I had a phone conversation with her brother about this and said that, yeah, like I sent this email to her and she made it public and we had a whole discussion about what had gone down and what happened. At no point did I say to her brother, fire Jillian. At no point did I say that not once, but Jillian was convinced that I told her brother that she should be fired. Not the case. Eventually she left Capstone. I mean, I wouldn't want a family member working for my company if they really can't like even, you know, you know, observe basic confidentiality, like, hello, you're opening up the company to lawsuits. Um, you know, so basic principles of confidentiality, this girl completely lacked. Um, but she accused me of trying to get her fired uh, when, absolutely not the case. Like, grow up and learn how to do a job properly. Uh, so eventually she left Capstone and now she works for Brotherwise Games and she is uh, organizing a live stream fundraising event for Gaza um, for Palestinians. And so many of the people who have responded to her, and again, she's one of the people who thinks I'm dangerous and has posted so much shit about me on Twitter years ago, like just a crap ton of shit about me. Uh, yeah, and now she's organizing a fundraiser for Gaza when she is someone who was all about the Met Gala. Now, people like me boycotted the Met Gala and other events because all eyes were on Rafa. The Met Gala is a distraction. These things are a fucking distraction. Celebrities are a distraction from what goes on in this world. So pro-Palestinian people, when the Met Gala was happening, said, boycott the Met Gala, all eyes on Rafa. Because anytime a big event is happening, Rafa is being bombarded and so many Palestinians are being killed. So, you know, I guess, you know, I shouldn't be one to like, you know, judge how people, you know, their level of Palestine support. But the fact is that most pro-Palestinian people boycotted the Met Gala. We're not talking about it. We're instead talking about Rafa. But Jillian on her Twitter, if you go to her Twitter, she was all about the Met Gala. She has a few posts here and there about Palestine and has a watermelon emoji in her name. But she is one of the people that back in 2021 was calling me dangerous. She's one of the people who supports Kids Table Board Gaming and Burnt Island Games. A complete contradiction, complete hypocrisy. If you are for Palestinian Lives Matter, then you should not be supporting a publisher who is Zionist. Yet all these people are. All these people supporting, you know, replying to her tweet, saying that they want to participate in this fundraiser, you know, and get involved. These are the same people who have shit on me back in 2021 for being pro-Palestinian and called me dangerous. Complete hypocrites. I mean, these people lack sense. They have no sense. They are just insane like i don't even understand this industry like this industry is just filled with hypocrites and zionist shills and yeah so that's it so that is my rant on the industry now was i contacted as one of the most vocal people in this industry for palestine to participate no and even if i was i would not want to i've done my own thing to support palestinians i don't live stream so i don't know how to do that so which is why i've not 
try to organize my own fundraiser for Palestine, but I personally have donated a lot of money to the cause and I have attended marches and I intend to attend a pro-Palestinian march in London if there happens to be one when I am in London. So, you know, and I raise awareness. I constantly post stories about Palestine in my Instagram stories. I talk about it in videos every week here. I post about it a lot on Twitter. So I have been raising awareness and doing whatever I can for Palestine in my own way. But the, I just have to point out these people's hypocrisy, just how insane they are, just what, you know, what assholes they really are. Um, so yeah, so I do hope money gets raised for Palestine, but these people are fucking hypocrites. Like, and they should stop supporting Burnt Island games and kids table board gaming and put their money where their fucking mouth is. If you truly support Palestinian lives, stop supporting Zionist publishers. Stop supporting your Zionist friends. Stop like, you know, coddling them. Stop like acting like this is not a huge issue. It is a big fucking deal. Our tax dollars are supporting this genocide. So if you're angry about women's reproductive rights if you're angry about black lives matter and all of that stuff and you claim to be caring about palestinian lives you should be caring about it in the same way that you care about those other issues you should put your money where your mouth is and if you don't that honestly just shows your true colors and it shows how little integrity you have when it comes to palestine and most of the people in this industry have no fucking integrity when it comes to Palestine. There is a content creator I follow. His name, or her name rather, is James is Smiling. They are a trans content creator. So um, they post a lot about Palestine and trans rights, of course. I really love their content. They post on both uh, TikTok and Instagram. So I've shared a lot of their stories in my Instagram, a lot of their posts in my Instagram stories because, you know, they really understand the, you know, how it, you know, they're a white person, they're a white trans person uh, who could pass for male if, you know, and they understand their privilege and they understand, you know, how minorities get shit on all the time. So they made a post recently about minority content creators and how it's minority content creators that when they speak up about issues, get shit on all the time and get labeled certain things when white people could speak up about those same issues and not have that happen to them. And that is exactly what happened to me in 2021. I'm a Muslim content creator who spoke up about Palestinian rights. You know, a Zionist publisher was not happy about it. I released the recording, which very much shows what a, you know, Zionist evil person Helena is and supports the killing of Palestinian babies. But I'm the one who's labeled fucking dangerous. You know, it's just ridiculous. It's fucking ridiculous. And it's Islamophobia. When you call a Muslim woman dangerous, it's an Islamic, it's an Islamophobia trope. Like that is one of the tropes of Islamophobia that all Muslims are inherently dangerous, that our religion is dangerous and so on. Even though if you compare the holy books of uh, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, Islam is no more dangerous than Christianity or Judaism is. If you look at all the things that every holy book says. And I understand that that's why a lot of people are atheists. A lot of people are atheists because they view religion as being evil, as, you know, supporting bad things. And I personally am against any bad things that, uh, you know, is allowed in Islam and it really causes internal conflict. Like for example, uh, you know, slavery was allowed. Now I will say this, I'm not, you know, despite someone who studied her religion in depth, um, you know, I personally, uh, disavow all the parts of my religion which i do not agree with and i will say that they were for a specific time and place slavery was legal at one point in time even in america does not mean it was right things that were legal at one point in time does not mean that they were right and the vast majority of muslims in this world do not agree with the bad parts the parts that do not align with human rights or, you know, things like that anymore. And same with every religion. Uh, so most people, you know, disavow those parts of their holy books and their religion and Muslims do the same. Uh, so we are no more dangerous than a Christian, a Jew or anyone else. Yet it's an Islamophobic trope uh, to call Muslims dangerous. And that's what happened to me in 2021. And to this day, so many people still think I'm dangerous and whatever and blah, blah, blah. Um, and they don't realize it's their own actions that sometimes, you know, can push people to actually want to talk to people that they also find that they find is dangerous. So like, you know, back in 20, uh, 20, I think it was when I went to, no, it was 2021 as well, when I went to Universal Studios and this one trans person started messaging me on Twitter or 
tweeting at me on Twitter like, oh, John Della Rose wrote an article about you. Why are you associating with him? Why haven't you blocked him yet? I had no fucking clue who this John Della Rose person was. But here's this person who is incessantly bothering me on Twitter, claiming that I have a, some association with this person who mentioned my name in an article, had no fucking clue who they were, and what happened as a result of that? I blocked this trans person because they were annoying the shit out of me and just bothering and they post so much shit about me all the time. Like this person was like seriously just obsessed with me and would not stop posting shit about me for the longest time. We're talking a couple of years, right? So I blocked them and then I actually ended up talking to John Della Rose to find out who this person was that they wanted me to block and that they were accusing me of associating with. So, you know, these people are just fucking stupid because they don't realize that their actions can actually cause people to like seek out things that, you know, they're actually pushing away people from their own agenda at times. I'm not saying that that happened to me because I'm pretty, like, I have a strong head. Uh, and I know what I want to do and no one can convince me of anything. I know what I believe in and I'm always going to believe in what I believe in and no one will convince me otherwise. So yeah, I do have some people like John Della Rose who follow me on Twitter. Does that mean I agree with what he says? Does that mean I we share the same views? Not at all. We disagree on a lot of things. He's actually posted a lot of Islamophobic shit, in fact. But at the end of the day, he doesn't harass me. He doesn't bully me like all these people who claim to be open-minded and diverse care about diversity do. It's the people who claim to be about, you know, diversity, who claim that they are not gatekeepers, who are the ones who are doing the fucking gatekeeping. How do they do gatekeeping? By like turning away people from the industry with their really shitty attitudes, honestly, quite honestly. And I've discussed this at length before. Like when I go to conventions, I don't sit down at a table and ask the person in front of me, oh, I need to know your political views about this, this, and this before I decide whether or not I want to play this game with you. Who the fuck does that? No one does that. You think when I go to UKGE, I'm gonna sit down at a table with some strangers if I'm playing a game with them and be like, uh, tell me your views on what's happening in Palestine and Israel before we play this game because I need to know what your views are before I decide whether I play this game with you or not. But these people will have you believe that that's what you should do, that you should only sit at tables with people who behave like you and think like you and act like you and just shun everyone else and everyone else should not be allowed at conventions. This is the kind of stuff that these people promote. I do not promote that. I do not agree with that. I believe everyone can believe in whatever the fuck they want because when I go to a convention, no one is treating me badly based on me being a Muslim woman, based on me not being a white person, based on me being a minority. I've not been treated badly. I've never had a bad experience playing with strangers because I don't fucking talk about politics when I sit at the game table. But if they want to, they can do that. But yeah, they've really become the gatekeepers of the industry so you know they are the ones who kind of turn people away from uh, the industry with their attitudes and there's a Palestinian woman who used to be a board gamer uh, and was you know also someone who posted on Eric Lang's post back in 2021 and his most and his uh, post back in October of this uh, 2023 when all of this started and she called him out she called out Eric Lang on his Facebook post for his shitty take this in October as well. Did Eric Lang respond to her? Here is this Palestinian woman board gamer. Did Eric Lang acknowledge her comment? Nope. If you scroll all the way back to October on Eric Lang's Facebook, you can find her comment and you can read and see how a Palestinian woman feels about what Eric Lang said. Again, totally missed the mark. Again, these people think that they're open-minded, think that they understand what's going on, think that they're supportive of Palestinian rights and Muslims and Arabs, but they're not. They're fucking not. And until they realize that they have limitations, until they realize that they don't understand Islam as it really is, uh, Eric Lang, I feel like, has been Islamophobic in the past. If they don't understand Islam, if they don't understand Arabs, if they don't understand the region, if they don't understand the struggles of these people, then just fucking shut up. If you don't know anything, then just fucking shut up. Otherwise, don't say anything at all. Otherwise, educate yourself. Like, you can fucking educate yourself, you know? That's something you can also do, and a lot of people have done that since October. A lot of people who were even Zionist have become pro-Palestinians after opening their eyes and educating themselves. So just fucking educate yourself then and stop being an ignorant asshole who, you know, is a Zionist shill and a Zionist sellout. So yeah, so that is my rant this week for Palestine. So again, educate yourselves, people. See what's happening in Rafah. See what is happening on the ground. Follow Palestinian content creators. There is a whole bunch of them. Follow content creators who come from a Jewish background who are pro-Palestinian. 
follow them as well because you know they'll give you a viewpoint that you're not going to get from Jewish Zionist people and again not all Zionists are Jews and not all Jews are Zionists so there are plenty of there's a lot of Jewish people who are anti-Zionist who are pro-Palestinians so go seek them out see what they have to say because you know their voice matters too uh, and yeah hear what they have to say and just realize that this industry is just full of Zionist hypocrites and shills and um, yeah Zionist shills Zionist sellouts and a bunch of fucking hypocrites uh, so yeah so let's move on so I was asked a question recently uh, that I kept on, I keep on forgetting to answer. And that question is, how do I decide which board games to display behind me? It's funny that that was asked recently because recently I was just going through my uh, TikTok feed and going all the way back to 2020 when I first started creating content. And I kind of missed the really colorful, colorful background I used to have with all the board games, like the shelves just filled with board games behind me. But in one way, it's good that I no longer have that because I feel like it could be distracting in the video and it's just better to maybe have just a couple rather than a whole lot um, and the way that my new house is my this gaming room is you know this is the setup I have um, you know and I can't shoot in any other place in this room with shelves behind me so this is the setup I have so how do I decide which games to display behind me I display games with uh, from publishers who I feel I have a good relationship with so I have a good relationship with Devere games I've never done sponsored content for them but they are always willing to send me review copies and I'm not just saying this because I get review copies from them but they produce some of the best games that I have played and love like they have produced so many published so many of my favorite games so that's why i have lacrimosa back there which is a devere game um uh navoria explorers of navoria is from dranda games who i have a good relationship with and i worked for them at essen and will be doing so again this coming essen uh, and then alley cat games who of course i have a good relationship with and uh, produce sponsored content for and then uh garfield games who i would say i have a good relationship with and shem was very kind to let me preview all three games from the South Tigris trilogy. I really, really hope I'll get to preview some of his games in the future, because um, I would really, really love to, but I know that the South Tigris trilogy, he especially let me uh, preview them because he knows that I'm of Middle Eastern descent and I reached out to him and he also uh, just checked with me to make sure that there was nothing in the rule book or in the game that would be like, improper for Arabs and Muslims. Um, so I did go through all of the rule books before uh, they were published to just, you know, take a quick look at them. Uh, just, you know, a very quick cultural consulting without any payment or anything like that, just to double check as a Muslim person and a, a someone of Middle Eastern descent. Um, so yeah, so I have a good relationship with Garfield games. And, you know, I like to uh, display games, which are uh, games that I previewed for Kickstarters, which are not yet released as well. Um, so those three are games I previewed for Kickstarters and are not yet released. Um, and I've made it, I, you know, I discussed in a video about bias uh, many months ago about how I choose the games behind me and I'm very clear up front when I've received a game uh, as a review copy and when I am sponsored to do content. Um, on the top row you can't see it but there's Dreadful Meadows and uh, Mythic Mischief and the only reason I have Mythic Mischief there is I do have a good relationship with IV Games and I've created content for them before. I don't know how they feel about me now with me being so outspoken about Palestine um, but you know I would hope that their feelings would not change because I've created content for them even after 2021 so I hope that this doesn't change things but you know I've had a good relationship with them and have created content for them so I have Mythic Mischief up there which is my favorite game of theirs I would say and then I also have Dreadful Meadows which is from Arcus Games and Shem Phillips also works for Arcus Games and I previewed Dreadful Meadows and it's a, you know it's a game that's available now so people can buy it um, but I've kept it up there just because I really love Halloween and again it's a publisher that I worked with just once but you know I was really happy to work with uh, that one time so maybe I'll change it up a little bit. Um, Mythic Mischief will probably stay there because it's a really big game and it just fits nicely on the shelf over there uh, where it, whereas it doesn't fit nicely in any of my other shelves so Mythic Mischief will probably stay there but um, the other ones will get changed up. Um, yeah so those are how I select the games behind me so let's move on. So this week's question of the week is inspired by Ada's dream. Someone posted a comment on uh, a Twitter post of mine about Ada's dream that they love 
uh, Ada Lovelace themed games and I'll admit I don't know of any other Ada Lovelace themed games. So if you know of any, please let me know because I would love to check them out. And the reason I wore my own Board Games in a Minute shirt today while talking about this game and while shooting my overview video is because there's a gear on my shirt and I just love how my logo is a, a gear because there's gears in so many games and there are gears in Ada's dream so it kind of went with the theme of the game. It's a game about computers, it's a game about creating a computer, being an assistant to Ada, helping her, so my shirt just worked really well with that. Um, so yeah, so let me know what other games you know about Ada Lovelace and if you don't know of any, like would you like to play some? Um, yeah, so I guess let me know about that. Um, and again, if you would like to buy some merch, please buy some before September so it doesn't go away. <laughs> so shameless plug again. So, and I will see you guys after UKGE. Um, so again, that will be, so I returned from UKGE on June 3rd. So I will be shooting a video that weekend. So you will not see a video from me until like June 9th. I believe that's the Monday. That is gonna be in June when you will see another video from me. So it's quite a long time, I know. And it's that way because, um, so yeah, you won't see a video for me for three weeks um, just because of the way my trip is and when I return. Um, so yeah, so I will see you guys in June and until then, uh, play games and have fun. So until then, bye.